morning, everyone. Welcome to this AM Upskills webinar. My name is Georgia Seagull. I'm the editor of Aesthetic Medicine, and I'm joined this morning by Phil Elder. Um, those of you who are familiar with Aesthetic Medicine, because I know this is streaming across a few of our um, brands, will know Phil as a regular contributor to AM, um, and he has also done quite a few webinars for us during our uh, various virtual events. And um, Phil is basically our go-to for all things, employment, motivation, finance, um, accounting, tax, all of that good stuff. Um, and we've, we're gonna start a sort of regular series with Phil where we basically talk through and expand on his regular articles in the magazine every month. So um, Phil's article for the March issue of AM was all about communication and how to communicate more effectively with your staff, especially thinking about the fact that we've obviously been closed for a long time. Um, we're gearing up to go back into clinics and salons, hopefully from next month. Um, and so just thinking about all the ways that you perhaps have maybe have been lacking a little bit on communication um, and how to basically just improve that and focus on getting your staff in the best possible mindset coming back in, explaining things that perhaps might be a bit difficult to explain to them about the business. Um, and obviously it's still a very uncertain time. So how you can really help staff feel more comfortable um, and involved and included. So Phil, welcome. Hi, Hi how are you? thank you for joining us. Um, so Phil and I are sort of just going to have a little bit of a chat, but if anyone's got any questions, please do drop them in the chat box um, or on Facebook and they'll be fed through to me. Rather than wait till the end to ask, I think we will feel free to pop them when they come to your mind and then I will just interject with the questions so we can have a bit more of a discussion um, and interaction. So Phil, do you want to maybe just give us a little bit of an intro probably in better words than how I no, explained cool. what you do, but to, so everyone knows kind of who you are and what you do. Okay, great. So uh, as Georgia said, to sort of uh, reiterate on that, those bits and pieces, uh, yes, I am a business coach and consultant, but I kind of take it very much the anti-guru sort of um, stance on this. So uh, to give you an idea, I'm not just a kind of business coach and saying, this is what you want to do. I actually own a clinic, myself and my wife own and operate our own aesthetics clinic. On top of that, like what Georgia mentioned about uh, tax and finance, I own a finance brokerage, I own an accountancy practice as well with a business partner there. So whilst I'm not an accountant, I do operate and manage those businesses, plus a number of other things, sort of property investment strategies and other sort of side businesses. But what I mean, that gives me an overview, fortunately, from um, a point of view that A, managing a clinic and how to implement those kind of business elements into your clinic, and then on top of it, the other subsidiary services and things that I offer um, within the business community and collection of companies that I have, obviously um, coordinate to give a kind of decent background base for bits and pieces that we're talking about. Um, one point I would like to really, really alliterate, there is no such thing as a stupid question other than the one that you sit there and do not ask. Um, you know, that you know, there is the whole point of these sessions is to expand on the magazine article so if you've read the article and there's something that you've left wanting and you kind of go oh i don't quite grasp it i don't quite get it or i want to find out a bit more information about it now is the absolute ideal opportunity and the reasons for bringing this is to actually um allow us to do that and have a, a bit more of a conversation around what's written so i can set out a four point and then we can develop that further and especially things like talking about communication whilst you know fingers crossed everything we are moving towards hopefully being able to go live uh, with events again and i'll obviously be joining the aesthetics med team for that um you know it gives us that chance at least virtually in the short term to explain things and demonstrate things wherever possible basically um so communication effective communication i think a real big key point that we've got to remember here is um from an underlying profit point of view um, your cost of hiring staff is very expensive. So what's nominally not looked at is, um, you know, the time element of how much time does it take you to sift through CVs, how much time does it take you to interview, et cetera, et cetera. So the maintaining of staff, um, keeping them happy is one, if you just want to look at a numbers person, bottom line profit. Secondarily, the fact that they feel comfortable, com comfortable, that's a new one, uh, a new 
you can see the homeschooling hasn't been working out on the English sort of thing, but more comfortable in your uh, environment, in their working environment, they'll be more uh, motivated to work with you if they share your values, your vision. Uh, they'll be, again, more motivated to work within the business and, and ultimately generate cash for you know the business and ultimately yourself as the business owner and operator. Um, so if you're looking at it even from a managerial point of view or you're looking at it from a clinic owner, the other thing to bear in mind is some of these communication skills can be tra transferred across. So if you are looking at using these with staff, you know, whilst the, we're talking about as a heading point, we've also got that these can be used as well with uh, patients, with, um, you know, friends, family, network, everything sort of thing. So, you know, use this, take away and, and at the same time think where else and how else can I use that? information that we're sort of working with um, and the point about the effective communication especially highlights at the moment is the nervousness around obviously COVID I don't want to be the one that keeps ranting on about it but you know we're all aware of it we're all aware of what's going on there's different levels of anxiety that people are having different levels of struggle with mental health etc that um, people may or may not be having and whilst you're keen to get back into your clinic and stuff. Some of your staff may not be so. Some of them may have underlying concerns, underlying worries and so on. And the ability to open up that communication channel, if you have not already, is paramount and vital so that those anxieties and things are not expressed onto your clients and your patients as they're coming into clinic. Because again, they need that sense of security, sense of um, safety, especially in the medical environment that we're operating in. And you need to, you know, have that filtering right the way through from yourself, right the way through your staff, and then ultimately to your clients and your uh, patients, basically. Mm. And so one of the first things you mentioned in the article was kind of on, on that note of <clears throat> people having obviously very personal and very varying kind of difficulties around COVID and, you know, whether that is very personal or to do with like money or health or whatever it may be. Um, and that as a business owner, you, you'd be forgiven if your first reaction was kind of, oh God, I can't, like, you know, I've got my own problems right now. I'm trying to think about the business. I'm trying to keep it going. Like I, I don't have the capacity to deal with all my staff members' concerns. Um, yep. So how, how is that, how, what are the benefits of um, actually, you know, digging your head out of the sand and facing that head on, even though that might seem like, yet another thing that you kind of you just don't have the capacity to take on and deal with yourself cool so it's a little bit of um as you say taking your head out of the sand unfortunately a little bit and and facing it as you say head on uh something i would do regularly anyway within the business is every three months have staff reviews anyhow uh, so that's something you may want to look at implementing but the, the kind of just if we looked at the benefit situation is that uh, a culture can develop within a business so if it's a them and us feeling you know you obviously need to maintain that you are the boss you are the owner you are the manager but if you can create a feeling where they're all of a team environment and a team feel and that their values and their opinions are uh, sorry their opinions are valued to you massive massive uplift because if you end up with a, a core uh, culture you know it's going back to if you've got somebody who's lazy and sits around and gets away with working four hours a day it will upset other members of the staff and they'll start either adopting that policy or rejecting that person so it's no different to if somebody's got anxieties around coming back to work um, they've got anxieties around is the business going to survive because at the end of the day your problems for example may be my business is closed my income has dropped significantly the company's income has dropped significantly how am I going to pay the you know the car repayments the mortgage the, how am I going to pay the school fees or you know put food on the table whatever that is that still filters down to your staff they're still sat there but their reliance is completely and utterly on you so they're only one reference point whilst you're sitting there going you know, it's like an hourglass. If you imagine their reference point is in the middle and their problem and focus is going, if this business fails and I lose my job, I'm potentially out of employment in a period where it's going to be difficult to find other employment. You're in the top end of the hourglass because you're sat there going, well, that problem is just one of many. I've got the lease to deal with. I've got the premises to deal with. I've got the insurance. I've got the reopening procedures. I've got PPE equipment to source. I've got, you know, etc etc plus my own personal problems within it the point to realize is they don't know that that your staff are not aware of that so 
they're in that hourglass point. So you need to be focusing on that and either one, aware, opening their mind to the fact that there is security within the business. Now, it depends how you feel and your relationship with your staff and individual key members of staff. You have maybe a stronger relationship with to discuss potential financial situations or implement implementations. But if you can express, you know, we have we have received X amount of government help. We have um, a plan for six months. We have a 12 month plan. We are financially stable. We are secure. We have growth plans. We have growth ideas. And so, you know, even if a lot of this is to be confirmed, it's the same as, you know, no different realistically a comment I made at the beginning of this, we're going to go live again soon with Aesthetics Med to be confirmed because that date could be moved by Boris. That the fact that we're going, the fact that that is going to happen is faith, is security that, you know, whilst we've been in this situation, we're coming out of it. So if you're able to express that to your staff to implement and sort of build in them that security, that is a, a, an absolute paramount importance. And on top of that, the other side is the anxiety, is anxiety of getting back to work. Open that conversation with them. You know, even if it's just from a suggestional point of view of saying, right, you know, get the team together virtually, et cetera, and say, right, we're looking to reopen. We're going to get back out there. Uh, has anybody got concerns over, you know, the safety working in the environment? You with me? Um, and you'll find we've had it here with the staff. We're now actually effectively everyone back in the office, but we've moved around slightly to make sure that everybody's obviously COVID secure from a personal point, uh, from a regulatory point of view, but on top of it, from a personal feeling and representation and happiness point of view. And so because a lot of people, you know, they may have had um, been having regular updates with their teams on Zoom or through text or phone calls or whatever, how do you think some people will be a little bit apprehensive about having that face-to-face -face communication again and actually physically being in an, in an environment around your staff um, or you know equally around patients when you haven't been for so long what are some um, some sort of tips of how people can work through that a little bit um, great so yeah, if it's if you've got those concerns the thing I think is that physical things to move, barriers, etc. So if you're wanting to connect with somebody, first of all, don't put any barriers in front of you. So I'm sat now at a desk. You want, don't want the person sat the other side of a desk. You want them spaced, obviously, from a COVID point of view, but remove any physical, physical barriers. And, you know, everyone's going on about Megan and, you know, the interview with Oprah and stuff like that. Take that shot, take that scene. They haven't got a huge, big coffee, to, a huge, big dining table, a formal environment. They're outside with nothing else in the background to distract distract they've got a low coffee table just as a feature point but it's low out of the way so there is no physical barrier the same with you know going back to like i said about merging these things across if you're able to do that within your consultations also that you are um sat aside from some from one of your patients and things they haven't got a physical barrier it opens that up it's same as body language tips and things along the way you know if you're going to sit there you know, arms folded, it is a defensive sort of position. It is not an open position. If you are sat open, you are, you are opening your body up. It is a natural instinct to sort of go, I'm, I'm open to absorb and be, perceive you vulnerable to a certain extent, but because they see that, they're being more reflective about the uh, language they'll use. They'll be more open to express their concerns and feelings with you. Um, and if it's even a, a case of just like informality, Go and grab a coffee, walk around the park somewhere, have a chat in that environment, try and ease back into it. Um, physical things as well. I, I think I mentioned in the, in the article as well, send physical cards out to people, you know, come, well, looking forward to seeing you again soon. Welcome back. That sort of stuff makes a massive difference in, a, in an environment where, you know, I sit with a phone, I can send George a message, for example, in a heartbeat. It doesn't take a moment. But as a result, that, that she knows that hasn't taken any real effort. With the greatest respect now if i'm going to send a card there's an effort involved there's an element of somebody reflecting on that and going the person cares about me the person values my opinion so try and meet them that way around go to them if you can for example you know if, if you if you are not able to provide an environment go to them meet them where they are meet them on their ground meet them on their turf you know their local area their park whatever it is it puts an element of security into what they're feeling. And it's it's almost like baby steps coming out 
Um, and if you imagine the sort of scenario where people obviously have been zooming and stuck inside for, it, for ages, if you think a pop star kind of thing or a rock star and so on, they don't start with their first ever gig in the O2 arena and crash and burn with nerves. They've gone on the circuit, they've built up that kind of feeling, the same, you know, so think of those real life examples and go, well, can I meet them on their turf? Can I meet them halfway and build that confidence up so that they're not feeling out of, out of sorts, so to speak. Do you think it might be a nice idea to do something like that with your team rather than just sort of saying to everyone, you know, circulating an email and saying, see you all back in clinic on Monday or whatever? Yeah. Would it be an idea to perhaps try and do something beforehand with the team, whether it is just a, a Zoom call or meeting for coffee when we can do that outdoors, some, something, or like you say, sending the cards and just, you know, something to... um yeah to ease people in more gently and to sort of say like we're all in this together we'll get through it rather than just coming in and expecting everyone to start working straight away again yeah 100 percent. the more effort you can make now that it will pay huge huge dividends basically mm-hmm. um so things we've done actively within our staff is we you know we had on fridays at four o'clock everybody hopped on the zoom everybody grab a drink so you know some people are on the gin and tonics and some people have got the wine out some people are on the diet cokes it doesn't really matter uh, and we've done like an online silly quiz thing so that completely unwork related, but it's created a sense of team and a, a sense of involvement in what's going on. Simple things like setting up a WhatsApp group with, you, with your, your team. And it can be just focused back on, you know, returning to work, you know, and just firing some messages, messages across. But anything that you can make on a physical sense is going to be far more valuable uh, it goes back to exactly what I said about the example of a card. If you can show that there's effort and more of a physical thing, obviously in a safe environment, a safe way to do so, it will far more uh, betterly received. So exactly every single opportunity you can to touch base with your staff at this stage in the ramp up to be open again is vital, absolutely vital. And it's similarly with your clients and patients as well. You know, reiterate, you know, this is what we're doing, a virtual walk around of the clinic sort of thing, for example, so that, this is what the place is going to look like now. Yes, there's some plastic screens here. Yes, there's PPE. Yes, we'll be taking your temperatures potentially on arrival, etc. But have that walkthrough so it's not an alien environment. It's like anything. The first time you fly, you sit in the plane going, this is alien. I don't understand it. A few times in, it's the most normal thing to do in the world. Yeah. You think of it exactly the same way. You know, people are now going back into an environment where they're communicating all of a sudden like this. You know, there used to be, you know, people with your facial expressions, as we all know within aesthetics, play a massive importance to your communication. You know, now that you're going to be, you're talking to everybody like that. So any opportunity you get to have a conversation with somebody without that mask is, is valuable. Mm. And what about if staff have concerns or questions that you don't have the answers to as a business owner, or you perhaps do, but it's not something you want to disclose, um, or yeah, it's not something you feel, because one of the things you mentioned as well in the article is everyone's going to have varying degrees of information that they feel comfortable sharing with their staff about the business. Yeah. So how, yeah, what if someone comes to you with questions that you just don't have the answer to or that you kind of do, but it's not necessarily positive and you just, how do you handle that? So I would say it's all a, bit, a little bit of what is the question, but to give you a few sort of go-to starting points, if you're with me, um I, i'm very much into transparency and honesty is the best policy so you know you may for example ask me in a session about um tax and i'll go yeah i can tell you how to structure a company it's the most tax efficient thing possible and then somebody might say but i've got a specific question about x i'll go i'm not the accountant i own an accounting practice but i'm not the accountant i speak mm-hmm. to my business partner i'll arrange a call and a setup for you so that honesty the best policy where it's like i don't know the exact answer to that question but I can look into it for you I can get that information for you Um, that's a great one because then at least when you come back with anything else it doesn't lose your position of trust if you break Mm -hmm. the trust it's gone forever it's far better to say I'll look into it and get back to you secondarily on that if you've got information that you don't particularly want to share for whatever reason um, then again it would be Simply, I would try and say, without boring you with the details. So if somebody's going, you know, how much, what's the financial situation of the business, for example? Are we going to be able to survive another lockdown? You, you know, giving you an example of a question, you can turn around and say, well, without boring you the details, you know, 
Uh, and depending on the person you're talking to, you know, you're not boring in the details. We don't need to get into spreadsheets and stuff like accountants love to do. But what I can tell you is that we have a financial structure in place to provide security for ourselves moving forward. And we have revised all our business operations and plans to, uh, you know, continue down this path. Yes, we may, you know, and if, you, if there's visual impacts that people can see, and especially as we go forward, there will be, well, we found in our clinic anyway, huge spike with, client, with clients and patients, a massive, massive spike, but that's not going to continue. It doesn't mean that that's the trend path. You're going to have a huge spike because it's no different to like, you know, I'm in lockdown haircut. First thing, I, you know, is go and get a haircut, but that doesn't mean I need one every single day. You know, it will taper off. And at that point, when it starts to taper off, then some elements of insecurity can come through within your staff, especially if they've got financial concerns, you know, and just say, well, you know, we may not experience the same growth as we were. However, we have a secure financial um, basis. We've got a great business model. We're in an industry that's traditionally always expanded and grown. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think and didn't have full belief in this. So, you know, stick with me. We know we're going, we're going places. It may not be in the same trajectory as we had been before, but let's all work together on this. And again, anything that you can use, language tips and stuff, never try, you know, we, if you listen to what I'm saying, we can do this together, united team. You know, it's the old adage, just remember there's no I in team. And I know, I, you know, it's a, a overused phrase, but when you're thinking and talking with people, if you can use the we together, combined, those sorts of words, it unifies everybody and creates that, that sense of security as well. Mm. And one of the other things that I think sort of on that note that you mentioned in the article was um, asking staff for their feedback about how they think the business can be improved going forward um, and whether or not that's something people may have been doing on an ongoing basis throughout lockdown, like having Zoom meetings with their team. Um, but that I think that's a nice idea for people to perhaps consider having like a sort of idea sharing session um, yeah. talking about yeah what they may have had time to reflect upon what you've had time to reflect upon changes you're thinking about implementing and asking them for their ideas and feedback as well to kind of it's still on that thing of like togetherness and we're all part of the same end goal yeah um, and, and things like that yeah, 100%. So if you think, you know, our clients pay to have a business consultant and mentor to get opinions and advice, you, you know, your staff are there, you're paying them. So whilst you're paying them, you may as well get an influence of advice, you know. So, um, you know, I'll ask, I, I, before we hopped on this, I've got a little kind of some shirts hanging up and stuff and said quickly, went out to the team, anybody's suggestion, should I wear this shirt or that shirt? Are you with me? You know, I've got... Uh, there's three people in the office immediately outside two go this one one goes that right vote wins off we go it's just it doesn't make a difference in really what shirt I wear but it increases that value that awareness that oh well, we are part of these decisions you know sharing that bigger goal that bigger vision you know you see the very Americanized things this is my mission statement this is what I stand for and these are my values you know transfer that down into your staff basically and let them feel that they're uh, they're feeding into that. And on top of it, bearing in mind, we're going back to hourglass stuff. If you're up at the higher end of the hourglass where you're going, I'm juggling this and I'm juggling that and I've got this stress and I've got this stress and this problem and this problem, somebody's fresh set of eyes without the blinkers, without all the weight on your shoulders that you're dealing with can often come up with a really, really clear positive idea. Are you with me? Um, it's no different to say market research, how much money people spend on market research on saying, you know, what is your opinion on XYZ brand of phone? Yeah, it's great for this, it's great for that. Are you actually portraying what you want to within your clients? Are you sharing that information? Is your mission statement, your values actually coming through? So no different with your staff. Are they getting that feedback uh, from you? Are they getting the correct feedback? And it can be, you know, the easiest thing can be a misunderstanding that then gets buried under the carpet, you know, uh, and I'm kind of talking, you know, we could end into divorce kind of caper here, but you know, <laughs> what I mean is any relationship takes work. Any uh, relationship that you have takes thing. I'm sure someone along here is sat there and gone, I've had a misunderstanding with my loved one at some point over the most silly thing. And it's because somebody's just misunderstood what somebody else has said. 
So yeah. take that into your business exactly the same way because you have a slight difference in that position. When you're sat there going, I'm in a, in a relationship, it's equal. There's often that staffing difference. And a big one, for example, in aviation. Uh, so I used, you know, I was a commercial airline pilot. Um, and you look at the transfer across into medical sector, the plan for sand operating procedures and so on is to get rid of some of that and to try and equalize that as much as possible. Yes, you still need to be a higher position, but to try and equalize that as much as possible stops mistakes because somebody else can see it and they have the confidence to say to you, I think this is a bad idea. You with me? You may not share that because you might have a grain of vision that's eight steps down the line and there's a specific reason you're doing that. But if they, if at that point that's squashed, then when there is a genuine concern and problem later on, that that key point can be missed. Mm. What do you have any advice for business owners who might be faced with staff saying that they're thinking about leaving or they've started looking for other jobs? And I know, I know, typically you probably wouldn't tell your employer that, but in the context of COVID and um, perhaps thinking about joining more stable sectors perhaps that wouldn't be as directly affected by lockdowns or even if someone's thinking has used this time to think about maybe applying for a job at another clinic like if, if your staff was to if a staff member was to come to you and say I'm just being honest I've got these concerns or you're perhaps noticing that performance isn't quite the same as before you know we, we closed the clinic do you have any advice about how people can deal with that or, or even if people are scared about the future of the business kind of despite what you say um and might be thinking about perhaps leaving cool De depending a little bit on the person and i mean it from a what role or uh, they have within your business so key members of staff now you should always have a system i mean we're slightly different within injectables on, and so on because there is a very much a reliance on that individual but the people should operate around a system so that as easily as possible, the person can be replaced, if you're with me. So you're not too heavily reliant on one individual because it's like they do my marketing, they do my ordering, and I've got no idea where I buy the products from. I've got no idea of the supply chain and I've got no idea of the marketing platforms and how to use them. Um, that's over resilience and sorry, reliance on one person. So the flip side on that side of things is that if there are key key member of staff that you need to hold on to them just again let's expand that so give yourself because obviously if they're going to just drop it on your lap it's usually as a surprise point of view if there's a performance thing take that time out to put them in an environment again once again that they're happy with so try and deformalize the environment and try and have a more friendlier in chat so if they come to you and say i'm thinking about leaving etc these are the concerns go Great, I really, really want to hear you. I'm massive, you know, you know my, your opinions and things are valued and you are a key valued member of my staff. I therefore want to dedicate the time to it properly. So your first reaction should be, I care about it. I want to dedicate time to you because that immediately shows willing, but it also takes you off the back foot of kind of going, what was all that about? Are you with me? Gives you time to think, gives you time to breathe, give it time to assess things. Book some time with them at some point. Again, if it can put them in an environment that they're happy with and any more informal environment. So you're not like, well, come and sit in my office and we'll talk over a desk. Let's go for a coffee and a chat and have a wander around, et cetera. And do it that way around. So they're more likely to open up the real reason because nominally it boils down to one key point. And they could be saying, you know, I'm concerned uh, about, you know, the hours that I work might not suit what happens if the schools close and I, how am I going to juggle this and how am I going to juggle that? It can be that point rather than anything else. And by getting yourself off of the back foot, giving yourself time to think and be aware and on board, it just, it's like anything, you know, surprise, you don't perform in your best way. Stress, certain element of stress, great, too much stress, you don't perform as well. Um, so first of all, tip on that one. Secondly, as well, if they are trying, you know, you, you've got to try and weed out as well with the reality that some people try it on just to see if they get a pay rise. You mm -hmm. know, I'm thinking about leaving and so-and-so is playing X. Brilliant. You know, um, and the other flip side, if somebody is genuinely has got a number of reasons that they're thinking about leaving with the greatest respect, they're better off out. Because simply put, they are going back to what I said before. If they're not creating this, if you're not in a team, team environment, 
then the performance of other staff will be affected as well. So you have to just then manage that process of how they leave from a HR point of view, but also on a time point of view from your business. If they are a key element member of staff, then again, meet them on their ground, go down that route because they're more likely to say, well, you know, I can work notice for you. I can support you. I can train you on this. We leave on best behavior, on best relationships. Um, but if they are effectively determined to, you know, if they don't really want to be there for one reason or another, and you cannot answer that question for them comfortably within your business, then they're better off not there anyway. Yeah, fair enough. That's good advice, I think. Um, are there any ways that people can sort of perhaps reward staff initially coming back into the business? Um, just to recognize kind of how difficult things have been or how sort of the adjustment that it might be taking to then get used to being back in the working environment and perhaps that having that initial kind of influx, hopefully of, of clients and patients. Is there anything that business owners can do to perhaps obviously, you know, not set them back a great deal financially, but to really kind of say to staff that I appreciate you for sticking sticking by the business, sticking through all of this, coming back in and coming back in with a willingness to kind of get stuck in and start working again. Cool. Um, yes. So slightly different, difficult at the moment because of the other issues of lockdown in that, um, you know, certain rewards and things are limited to us. You know, we're kind of semi stuck with Amazon gift vouchers and all the rest of it and so on, rather than nice days out and trips out and team events and so on. But one is thing that is absolutely paramount, I think, is that if you give somebody money um, of a pay rise variety, what actually tends to happen is it very rarely goes on them. And so what I mean with that is if your member of staff goes and you've got, say, a family, you know, if you go, hey, here you go, I'm going to give you a pay rise, Phil. Um, I go, okay, great. My paycheck goes up slightly each month. I go home. What I may do is clear my mortgage off slightly earlier. I may treat the family to a takeaway. I may go and buy my kids some new toys or I might, you know, oh, that's brilliant because the I've got to get new uniforms because the children are growing for school and that will save it coming out of my money. But they do not get the reward. So what you've done is you've given them that, but they don't get the, you know, the, the actual endorphin release that you would mm. do if they had something personal to themselves. And more yeah. often, you're going to have to make a higher financial kind of difference. So, you know, we're talking, here's thousands of pounds a year pay rise. So now you can go on holiday each year, or here's a big company car that you don't really need or whatever, massive cost in that as opposed to if you can give them something that they really want, this comes back to this relationship with your staff. If you've got that relationship with your staff, if you haven't, don't panic, start speaking to other staff members, try and find out a bit more, go beyond social media, link with your staff on social media, have a look at the sort of things they're into. So if you took me, for example, like I like race cars, flying, kayaking and so on, and obviously family man, but if you want to be really brutal, you kind of go, well, here's a, track day experience or here is a ticket to a racing event because I'm the one that gets to go and basically be selfish because I can go home to my family and say I, I would love to spend the weekend here but I, today I've got to go to such and such because I don't want to waste this voucher and I get to have an absolute me time selfishly but the reward comes to me the endorphins are released in me the happiness is in me and therefore it goes that way you know how many times has somebody potentially gone home and gone oh, I've got a bonus and they go and speak to their partner and their partner goes, well, they don't value enough because that's not high enough bonus. Mm. Yeah. So the actual physical costs, if you went and said, here's a 49 pound voucher for, for uh, a gift of an actual thing, or here's um, 12, 15 quid's worth of flowers delivered to your door mm. with your name and a card on it. If you go, here's a 15 pound bonus this month, which yeah. is going to be more, which is yeah, going to make you exactly. higher impact. You with me? Yeah, so having having it something that's actually like a tangible um, object or experience that they can is just for them that they can experience just for themselves. And like you say, you know, a, a 10, 15 pound bunch of flowers that, you know, though most of us love receiving flowers and it's such a simple gesture and it's nothing kind of groundbreaking. But I can imagine to have something like that after your first full week back in clinic 
you know, when you might be flat out and all these anxieties and, oh my God, everything's changing again, that would be massively appreciated, I'm sure. Yeah, and that monetary cost is often significantly less than, than actually trying to give money. It's, it's, it's all back to what are the Christmas presents and things that, or birthday presents, what are the ones you truly remember? They're the ones that somebody's made an effort for, mm-hmm. you know, that that's the big difference, that not how much it cost. So yeah. if you're just using that same concept, that same psychology in rewarding your staff, what's the thing that's either opened up to me personally, that the person, we're going right back to what we sort of said at the beginning, by sending someone a physical card is a bigger difference than a message. By um, reaching out and meeting them at that place, by showing that you've made an effort and there's a thought process behind it, matters far more than actually any money that you kind of impart. Mm. Or even something like having sort of treats or snacks or getting coffees in and in the clinic, something like that even surely, right, would just be, you know, it, it would show staff that they're appreciated. Yeah, we just bizarrely, we had a conversation about Jaffa cakes in the office last week. And I happened to be in the shop last night and there's like cherry, pineapple and passion fruit version of Jaffa cakes. I brought them in and jokingly said, right, it's Jaffa cake tasting day today. Kind of, you know, tally up on a whiteboard. Who, who's up for the cherries thing? Who's up for this? And it's just a different, you know, that's the fact that I've thought about it, it just creates a different feeling in the atmosphere. And, mm. it, you know, and it's a few quid, it's a few quid that you've spent into it, but it creates a totally different um, atmosphere as well, straight away. Yeah. And recognizing as well that everyone, it might take people a while to start feeling, you know, to start being super back on the ball and super efficient and really in that kind of super focused work headspace, recognizing that it is something that will need to be sort of um, worked into yep. and have a, having a bit of a sort of relaxed, fun element whilst you whilst you sort of settle back into that. Yeah, a key point to think is that where I think a lot of people go wrong is they go, why, are not, why I want my staff to work as hard as I do. They are never going to work as hard as you do because they don't have the equity stake in the business. Are you with me? They don't have the vision and the passion to do that, you with me? There's there's so many more people work for people than actually run their own businesses. The reason behind it is that you're unique because you've started your own clinic and business to do this. So to expect that everybody else to be the same as you is fundamentally point one number one. The secondary thing is be aware to you know pedestalize to try and bring this balance back. So I think before we were say up here. So there's nothing wrong with coming to the end of the week and going. I don't know about anybody else, but I am absolutely zonked. You know, I'm going to have a GNT at the end of this Friday session. Who's up for it? You know, and then everybody's going, I don't, you know, uh, who else has found this a tough week? God, we've had so many patients in long hours. Isn't it really tiring? Everybody's, yeah. Oh, and that's a great, a bond. It's a moment. It's a, it's yeah. a different experience than actually going, right come on guys didn't we crack it out well done everybody you know come back next week it's gonna be hard but we're cracking on thanks very much big motivational speech off you go you're not joining the people you know it's it's different you know you'll see me as said in my life i'll be like yeah just cheer up because i'm trying to energize people that i haven't got personal contact with but these are your staff you have a personal contact with so you can create that that bond and people respond differently to to things like that as well don't they that's something you just sort of talked about in the article as well is that getting to know your staff on an individual basis which hopefully most people will do by now if if you've had your team with you for a while but knowing that some people personally I do not respond to the whole kind of motivational speech rallying pushing through I'm someone I hate that where and but people are different aren't they and you may think that you're being giving this big pep talk and being really motivational and pushing through that people will, that that will really help people. But some people it will have the opposite effect. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it, you can just reach that whole, like a little, uh, I'm just looking around. So a little thing with a phone at the end of a Friday to some team. So for example, you might have to, I've got to run off because I've got to take, take myself as an example. So that example, that, uh, explanation about like at the end of the week let's all sit and have a drink together or something like that some people may not be able to some people are like oh I've got to run off because I've got the school run and so on no worries a simple you know 
photograph of you with a glass of wine and going cheers so and so thanks ever so much your week or here's something to take home with you i really appreciate everything you're doing the 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 moment that you've reached out to them at nine o'clock ten o'clock in the evening you know that's taken a fraction of your time to make them think that person does care about me that person i'm in their thoughts outside it's not just a simple yeah. they are at work work them as hard as we can go home don't complain don't come at me with any other issues are you with me yeah. by just yeah. all bits like that and like I, I came that's a slightly awkward example in that i'm saying you know just send somebody a whatsapp because I'm, I'm advocating not to do that but what i'm trying to get just to kind of confirm that point is every time you can do a physical meet do so every time you can give somebody a physical thing do so if certain situations currently and so on limit you to do so at least reach out in the most personal way you possibly can yeah yeah even just to, you know to let someone know that you're thinking about how they may have made your day easier or yeah. you know and and doing that via a text message as you say sometimes might be your only option but it's still thoughtful yeah. um I've had a question from someone, I think just when we were talking about gifts, um, asking what the tax implications are for gifts to your staff. Uh, so by the amount of the business, gifts can be put into, so that it's there's a difference between a gift and what's called a benefit in kind. So if you're giving somebody one-off gifts like flowers and things they are and can be tax deductible, if you start doing things like here's your gym membership uh, on a monthly basis, here's a company car, that starts to fall into the ramifications of a benefit in kind, which starts to become taxable, if you're with me. So um, depending on your current tax situation and their tax situation, you know, look into what can be, because you can, there's situations where you can go, actually, that, I've just given that person a company car and they're worse off because of it. Uh, you'd be better off, you know, getting them to charge back mileage and increase the mileage allowance sort of thing. So, but for one-off simple gifts and that sort of stuff, yeah, you can do that. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, if anyone's got any more questions, please do pop them in. We're going to have to finish in a minute. But Phil, I know you wanted to talk about a little um, sort of offer you've got for our readers, if you want to explain. Yeah. So uh, I normally sort of charge £150 an hour for sort of one-off consultations and things with people. So if, as you've all been action takers and come along today, uh, and like I said, I'm social, I like a chat, I, I like the next person. So if you want to, uh, I think Sophie was going to put the link into the chat. If not, I will do so. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. It's perfect. So if you follow the link in the chat, that will take you to my kind of diary booking system. So you can choose a time that's suitable for yourself. And if you put in the discount code of 50 AM, um, that consultation call will only cost you 50 pounds. So if you've got more questions about what we're talking about today or other bits and pieces, you know, feel free, use that. Um, this that it is only for people who have been today you know that's not going out anywhere else I don't do that anywhere else it's just a myself and the team at Aesthetics Meadow are working obviously very closely together so uh, from my way to reach back and say you know yourself as readers and you know of the magazine etc um, here's a little reward for you so if you want to go in more depth or some of you may be sat there going, I'm not, there's loads of questions and queries I've got, but I'm not happy to share that in a public environment. That's often the way, like, you know, like Georgia raised about that as well earlier. Then again, leverage that, use that, and we can have an on-off kind of private conversation about those bits and pieces to help, basically. And that code is valid only till tomorrow, but they obviously don't need to actually have the consultation between now and tomorrow. They just need to book it, right? Yeah, so basically speaking, for the rest of the day and tomorrow, use the code. If you want to book that for six months time, you can. That's not a problem, you know. So there's no time limit on when that call can take place, only that that code will only be valid today and tomorrow because, simply put, it's only for uh, people who are here today. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Phil. That was really, I hope everyone found um, that advice helpful. Um, and we will be back. So you're, Phil's going to be writing um, sort of building onto this but next article in the april issue is going to be about returning to clinic right and um all the sort of mental health implications of that and the uncertainties and just how to kind of get going and or be okay with the next weird stage of life at the moment yeah it's really the focus we're gonna you know i envisage 
looking at the previous trends, and I know this we've got not a lot to look at, but we're going to see spikes, there's going to be drop offs, there's going to be spikes, and it's going to be an uncertain sort of period. So how to deal with that, um, and how to kind of cope with the uncertainties and how to try and flatten the curve, so to speak, so there's a more steadier growth pattern that you can work better with, manage better with both professionally and mentally kind of thing. Yeah, so then we'll be back for another webinar on that next month to expand. Um, if Yeah, I mean, get in touch with Phil, definitely. If you if anyone has any questions about anything they'd like to see Phil talk about um, in an article and then with a follow up webinar, let me know. Um, yeah, anything at all, just get in touch. And we really hope that was helpful. Thank you so much, Phil, for sharing your expertise with us. Pleasure, as always. Um, and we will talk soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.